Good morning, everyone. Thank you again for joining another episode of From the Ground Up, real-time issues or real-time solutions for MWBEs, sponsored by Queen Strategy Partners, a collaboration between three MWBE businesses with Nicole Valentine, Esquire, Danielle Douglas, and myself, Dr. Stacey and C. Grant. We are so excited that you've been joining us throughout our journey together in this year, especially through the difficult moments of 2020, learning how to pivot so your business can still be profitable. We've been bringing you all of the experts and today is no different, but I'm so excited that you've also adjusted to our schedule where every other week for this fourth quarter in the year, as we wrap up season one, uh, from the ground up. So thank you for tuning in. Thank you for sharing this broadcast with your other colleagues who you think can benefit from the information that we have. Follow us at Queen Strategy Partners here on Facebook as well as Instagram. And you can get the replays to our shows on our YouTube channel. So thank you so much for tuning in. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce my beautiful dynamic boss co-host, Ms. Danielle Douglas. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Stacey, for that wonderful introduction. As I always say, um, I want to say good morning to all. Uh, we are excited about the guests that we have on today because our topic is payroll, the critical importance of documenting your employees correctly and paying yourself. It may sound like a mundane topic and it may seem kind of boring, but we realize very quickly the importance of payroll and documenting our employees correctly and paying ourselves when it came to COVID-19 and the PPP loan. Mm -hmm. So we thought that this was an important topic because as we pivot and we realize things that we could do better, this is one of those important topics that could make a big difference in your business. So without further ado, I want to introduce our guest today, and that is Ms. Samantha Champagne. She is a founding member of Champagne Dawkins, which is located right in Rosedale, uh, Queens. Samantha serves as the business advisor for businesses and individuals assisting them in matters involving taxes, audits, reviews, and compilations. Her clients include for-profit and non-profit entities, and she provides consulting services that customize strategies based on the needs of each client. Prior to Champagne and Dawkins, CPA, CLLC, Samantha was a vice president of finance at Goldman Sachs, where she specialized in accounting, performance, risk, and regulatory reporting in the United States and Brazil. Samantha started her career at Deloitte & Touche, where she worked as an audit manager who served as a key point of contact for client engagement. Samantha is a member of the American Institute of CPAs and is a member of several nonprofit boards. So how are you doing this morning, Samantha? I am doing fantastic. I am, I'm happy to be a part of this forum, happy to help small businesses in our area and beyond. I, I just saw a, 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 a hello from one of my clients who is on the call. I didn't realize. <laughs> yeah. You have one of your friends. Yes. So I'm going to say Elizabeth, ditto that Samantha is amazing because I want to say that Samantha has at least two of her clients on the call today. That's Elizabeth and that's me. I <laughs> utilize Champagne Dawkins for my payroll as well. And they do a phenomenal job, I must say. And I will also say that I'm one of those folks that Samantha consults with, right? Yes. I had to go to Samantha late last year. She sat down. We did the Ben Franklin of pros and cons, the taxes. And she just like, it was like the waters just parted. Because that one hour made the world a difference in giving me the clarity that I need. I was, I, oh my gosh, I was pulling my hair out with my traditional CPA. He was driving me crazy. And I was like, I need Samantha, right? So, and Samantha came through. So I'm just saying that as a true testimonial, I'm sure Elizabeth is saying amen to that because Samantha has made the world of difference for me. And I pester 
Samantha all the time. This is probably like the fifth time I said, Samantha, can you can you speak here? Can you do this? And it's like she's so busy. You know, I got I got to get her when it's good. <laughs> more often than not, we don't get this get to have this time with Samantha. So we got to maximize it and get all this knowledge this morning. So well, I'm I'm so excited, Danielle and Samantha. Everyone is speaking so highly of you. I can't wait till I get my opportunity. I think I'm going to switch my company and come over to you. So, thank you for joining us for the show. Elizabeth oh, Madison. Pleasure. Yeah, Elizabeth Madison is one of my other partners in my many uh, ventures. And she said that you cleaned her books up. So, honey, you got a <laughs> testimonial that you didn't even realize coming on from the ground up. That's how we do. You don't know who's connected to who in this forum. It's really an opportunity for us to give real time solutions for real time issues. And we've been true to that. And we want to jump into the question this morning because some people are still on the fence of how they should really be moving forward. And Danielle said it, you know, with COVID and the PPP loans, it brought a lot to the surface. So, number one, can you explain what options a business owner has when it relates to establishing payroll? Do they need to hire a company or service, or can they just try to track it the old fashioned way? <laughs> you know, it, it's interesting. I think one of the things that a lot of people don't even realize is the type of legal entity that you formed when you started business actually dictates a little bit how you do payroll. Mm. So a lot of a lot of folks nowadays they formed LLCs because they're very popular. Um, there there are a lot less formalities than corporations when you set up an LLC. But one of the things LLCs don't necessarily allow is payroll. So if you are an LLC, from a tax standpoint, the LLC is disregarded and it, you're treated like a sole proprietorship. So that's one of the things to know is that the type of entity that you create actually drives whether or not you even do payroll. Now, say you are an LLC, you decided that you want to do payroll, you started off, you didn't know. You can do at elections to be treated as corporations for the purposes of doing your payroll. So I just wanted to mention that. And in terms of how or what kind of options you have for payroll, you could do it um, yourself. You could hire a professional. There are a couple of things you should know based on which route you take. So one of the things that, um, one of the taxes that if you have a liability due that actually pierces your corporation's veil, it's, no, it's not protected legally, is payroll taxes. Payroll taxes and sales taxes, irrespective of whether or not you have a corporation or LLC, and a lot of us form those to give ourselves protection from liability. If you have those two types of taxes outstanding, they're considered fiduciary taxes, by the way, they will come at you personally. So you want to be careful about your payroll taxes and how you, you pay them and how you run the payroll. And for that reason, I recommend that unless you have the time to do the calculations, to do the filings on time, you consider hiring a professional. And there are many tools out there. Some of them are relatively inexpensive. Um, I would say that, you know, even for the service providers, if you engage one, the types of service levels are also different. Mm -hmm. So you have someone who will calculate your taxes and your payroll and tell you, okay, this is the amount for the period, but they may not file the related tax returns. So even when you engage someone, you want to make sure you fully understand what it is that you're getting. So one, consider a professional because you want to make sure it's done right. Secondly, the type of service that you sign up for is important. So we've had clients who use um, some of the service providers and they provide them the, the pay stubs, they give them the numbers, but they don't actually file the returns. Filing the returns is crucial. If they're not filed on time, there are penalties that come from the Department of Labor, for example, if you don't file on time, they charge you $1,000 each quarter that you're filed late. That's expensive for most small businesses. So you want to make sure that you have a full understanding of what you signed up for. Um, did, I, did I answer that first question? You, you more than answered it. And I, before Danielle jumps in with another one, I just want to go back to the LLC just to remind folks, like you said, you can opt to file as an S corp, like there's a an election, but you have to make sure you're talking to a professional so you don't mess yourself up. We don't want Uncle Sam coming after you. But thank you for for that breakdown because it's a critical part of business and for MWBE to be able to have their structure properly to account for payroll. So now that was phenomenal. But Danielle, 
I know that you want to, I'm like, she's ready to jump in. She has another question because there's so much that we want to hear from you about because we know this could be the turning point in this fourth quarter for some of our MWBEs who are part of our audience. So yes, I am chomping at the bit because I have a couple of questions, but just to build on what Stacy said, is there any benefit of um, incorporating as an LLC and then opting to deem yourself for payroll as S Corp? You know, is should you do that or should you just go ahead if you can and start off with um, having your business be, you know, an S Corp or a C Corp? So it's a good question. And there are nuances. So there are differences between the LLC and the S Corp where some people want to go with the LLC because even though for tax purposes, you you might be disregarded if you're a single member, um, the election is really being done on a tax basis. So that election is for taxes. So, you know, LLCs have certain benefits that some folks want to enjoy. For example, the, the removal of some of the formalities that you would have in a corporation don't necessarily exist in an LLC. Um, you know the the resolutions to do certain things that you would you would have to do for a corporation. You could bypass those for LLC. And then even in terms of legal protection, it depends. And I don't want to get too much into the legal areas, but depending on even what state you are in, LLCs offer different types of protection. Mm -hmm. So it depending on the industry and the state and your business, you may still want to have that LLC structure, but be choose an election to be treated as a corporation for tax purposes. Got it. Okay. All right. And um, also, what are the taxes and insurance related to payroll? Okay. You know, at, mm -hmm. So the, the taxes, sometimes we get a little confused on the federal and the state tax. Those are not expenses of a business. Those are withholdings that are taken out of an employee's pay. So income taxes are not the responsibility of the, the, uh, the, the employer. However, the employer is responsible for withholding those taxes and transmitting them to the related agencies, those withholding taxes. The actual expenses that an employer incurs for payroll are their portion of social security in Medicare. And that responsibility is split half and half between the employer and the employee. Typically that consolidated is about 15%. And the employer is also responsible for paying federal unemployment insurance and state unemployment insurance. And um, those are typically the expenses that are required and expenses for a business. The income taxes, even though they, they look big and they look like they're your cost, they're not. They're just withholdings that you're making that transmits itself over to the agencies on your employee's behalf. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's important to make sure that they're filed properly. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, this this is good stuff. We thank you for it. And now we're going to get into the other nitty gritty because if we tell the truth, a lot of businesses go with independent contractors. Mm, I've done that versus yeah. employees. Yeah. So what would you say you would want to tell our small businesses on how to really designate someone as an independent contractor versus a direct employee? So that's a great one. I mean, a lot of times we come across people and we talk about how did you classify your, your human resource? Is it an employee or is it a contractor? And because as an employee, the employer incurs the state unemployment insurance, the federal unemployment insurance, and the social security and Medicare I just discussed, some people, you know, it's, it's, it's less expensive for them if they classify someone as an independent contractor because you don't have those expenses to pay when you have a, a contractor involved. The challenge there is that the classification of employees or and I shouldn't say employees of, of workers is a sticky one because imagine then that when you misclassify someone, you have now derived the federal government from the um, unemployment insurance and the social security and Medicare associated with such and the state as well. So those agencies do not like misclassifications because it derives them of income. The one of the challenges we've seen is sometimes the misclassification happens and then subsequently the parties part so you no longer have that that person employed or working for you and they file for unemployment insurance then you get scrutinized because here is someone that you never had paid unemployment insurance for while you had engaged them and they and this has happened recently now with you know a lot of folks being unemployed 
some people who are classified as an independent contractor, um, they, they file for unemployment. And even before, we had instances where people filed and there comes an issue, Department of Labor comes knocking to see if they were classified incorrectly in the first place. So the question is, how do you classify someone? It really depends on how you've engaged them. The big word to consider is control. Do you control their work hours? Do you tell them when to come to work and when to leave? Do you provide them with the supplies and the materials to do their job? Do you tell them what to do? So, you know, if you come and you tell someone, you know, I need you to be here from nine to five and this is what I need you to do. It's a little harder for you to say that that's not someone that's under your control. Now, an independent contractor, typically you'll say to them, I'd love to get this done. I'm not gonna tell you when to do it, how to do it, but I like it done by a certain date. And there is a little, there, there is not as much control because you're not saying when to do it. And that person doesn't necessarily just work for you alone. So if you have someone who works for you and other people as well, then that's something else that kind of speaks to the fact that you're not controlling them. But if they work solely for you, you dictate their work hours, you supply them with all the materials, and the timelines to get things done, then you have what's considered control. So that's the question. The classification is really deemed on whether or not you have control of the activities of that person. And a lot of misclassification happens, I, I have to admit it. A lot of times it does because it's less expensive. And most people will never even get caught or it may never come up. But if that person files for unemployment or if for any reason you were audited by any of the unemployment insurance bureaus, then it becomes a tickler and a, a sticking point. So to build upon that, can, uh, talking about employees, how do you even designate yourself as a business owner? Mm -hmm. And how do you, and so that's one thing. And two, how do you determine what is the appropriate salary, salary for yourself as a business owner? So normally officers of a business are considered employees. Um, it's typically the, the, the case where an officer is considered an employee. In terms of deciding what to pay yourself, you really have to look at your budget and your cash flow. Businesses in their infancy may not have the cash flow to pay an officer um, salary, even reasonable salary, because the cash may not be there. So it's expected that in the onset of a business, they will need time for you to, um, to ramp up the business and your payroll may not be where it should be. But if, if, you're, if you're a company and you're reporting revenues of a certain amount, and um, say for example, and I'm making up numbers, you reported that your revenues were 200,000, your costs um, were some, you know, 50,000 and you have a net income of 150. It's reasonable then that there was cash flow to support um, the, the, the W-2 or compensation of, of an officer. So the numbers really make a difference. It's not like a hard and fast rule to say you must pay yourself. It's really based on whether or not the business has a cash flow. Because even if you have net income, if you're ramping up or you're using your cash to buy equipment and to do other things to expand your business, then you, know, you can demonstrate that you're still ramping up and therefore it depends. A mature business that's been around for several years that generates cash um, that shows income, it's difficult at that stage to say that, you know, I, I'm not paying myself. And and even when you pay yourself, it needs to be considered reasonable. And again, that's a great statement, right? What is considered reasonable? You know, it really is dependent on your situation. And it's something that you do want to talk to your, your CPA about when you're making those types of decisions. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you said something about, I'm with Stacey, I'm going to let you jump in, but you said something about net income. If mm -hmm. you're paying yourself as a business owner, and thank you, Mecca. Mecca said I, I, that was a great question. So I hope this is a value, us following up with this, a follow-up question. And that is that if you are a business owner and you're paying yourself and you just said something about net profit, really that's your, in the general and administrative expenses, right? That's part of your expenses before you get to the net profit. So if there is net profit, what does that look like in regards to a business owner even doing like a profit sharing or a, you know or something that they not only pay themselves a salary in the general and administrative but based on the net profit they can take you know additional income or it's right. you know or something i mean that's totally allowed and recommended mm -hmm. one of the things that um business owners 
don't always factor in is you know arrangements for retirement or for exiting the business mm -hmm. so when you when you get to the place i mean a lot of these decisions and when to start doing stuff you kind of decide them along the way with the professional who's assisting you they can say you know if you have a trusted advisor they'll say at this point have you considered that you may now start to do a, even a, a step a, a simple employment plan for like a you know a small business or different products that are out there for small businesses the profit share is also an option there are different products that you should start thinking of when the business is healthy and can support it these are things that you also get tax deductions for so they're benefits for once you establish that you have net income you're on payroll to then go to the next step and put the other um products in place so that's a great segue into uh, one of Mecca's questions. And thank you, Mecca and Elizabeth and all of you who are tuning in. What percentage should you pay yourself? So you kind of touched on that. Um, mm -hmm. Is there some sort of formula as a business is ramping up that you use as a recommendation when they're looking at what to pay? And have you also had businesses who hold back on paying themselves until the cash flow is there, but they have an amount that they're kind of holding for what to do then at a certain time. So it's it's there's not a hard and fast percentage. It really depends on the business. It depends on the industry. There there's some businesses that whatever the net income is, they can use that to you know um, pay themselves. And there are businesses that are capital intensive where they have to use that money to reinvest into themselves to buy equipment and to get other things for expansion. So it's really not you know okay take it twenty percent. It's not that simple. You, 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 you could come up with a number that you think is reasonable and you can talk about it with your professional and together you can kind of nail down what would be the best for you in your scenario. Awesome. So Danielle, I have, I'm sorry, you had another question, Stacey? No, no, I'll let you go in. I said, it looked like you wanted to jump in with another one. I have one holding, I'll come back to it. <laughs> okay, because I have one that I just thought about, but I think it's important as well. Okay. And that is with the PPP, right? So I'm kind of shifting gears. So with the PPP, there is now talk about forgiveness, right? There are some right. business owners who did get the PPP and now there's a ton of webinars going on about how you can get the forgiveness, you know, make sure you do what you need for the forgiveness loan. So have you been giving your clients um, guidance, even that as it relates to payroll, so they can make sure that the money that they receive from the PPP is forgiven. Right. So, I mean, that's a very interesting topic, the PPP. And to back up a little bit, as you mentioned earlier, there were um, several missed opportunities for people to participate because they did not have the payroll records to support getting that advance. So I think one of the lessons from the old exercise here is that we should um, ensure that your business is paying its officers and um, you, you being self-employed, it doesn't, um, you know, th there are ways of, based on your entity of taking monies out because that was one of the challenges too. People were taking money out, but it was a corporation, so there was no payroll. And um, it's important to have that documentation and that trail. So that's the one point. Now, in terms of forgiveness, there, there's still quite a bit of, there's guidance out already and some of it is is possibly changing. So my advice is for our clients, for some of the ones that had small amounts, we can start the um, the forgiveness process. But you still have time to go in and to make that request for forgiveness, and maybe wait a little bit longer to see how things settle. Um, I know several um, lenders have not even completed the establishment of the protocols to start with the loan forgiveness. And it, it's expected to be paper intensive. So I know there are talks about wh what exactly are we going to end up? And even possibly with another round of stimulus, there may be implications. So, I mean, I, I would say for the smaller ones, if, you're, if your lender has the ability to accept forgiveness, then you can go ahead and start it. But you do have a little bit more time, I would say, just to wait a little bit longer. Thank you. So. Stacey, I'm passing it off. I know you said you had a question in mind. Yeah, I, I, I mean, so much is going through my head as you're speaking and we're thinking about the information that you're sharing, which is so valuable to those who are new and, and Mecca was asking for that formula. So I hope that um, 
that helped. She said, thank you. She said, she's loving the information. So we just <laughs> want you to know you have a new fan as well that tuning in. But the, you were just talking about the PPP and, and being prepared and ready. What, there might be another round of mm -hmm. stimulus. You know, we could only pray, right? That's happening. So what would you say to the business owner that's listening to the information that you're giving now? What would be that first step? Like, how do you help your clients? I mean, you have raving reviews from Danielle and from Elizabeth. So what's the, the first step in consulting with you? Is it a consultation? Is it your website? Where can we go to get that information? Mecca's like, yes, I need to know. So I want to just insert that before we continue our dialogue. So let wait, this is a joke, Stacey. I just call 718 690 3530. I know the number by heart. I am the walking commercial for Champagne 718 690 3530. And you can pick up. <laughs> yeah, that, that is definitely the number. Definitely the number. But you know what I would say I for when, when we're onboarding new clients, one of the things that we try to do is to do an initial consult, um, about 30 minutes or so, which is free. I think it's important when you have a, a new relationship for both parties to kind of meet and assess each other and figure out if the relationship will work. I think it really has to be a connection for it to be productive. And therefore, um, we, we normally do that, where if we have a new client, we'll do an initial consult and um, we'll kind of figure out, is there a good chemistry here? Can we work together? And then we can take it from there because everybody has different needs. There are different stages of their businesses. And when we, once we meet and we kind of assess where you need to, um, to be and what, what, your, what help you need, then at that point, we can kind of chime in and, and offer input. Payroll is one of those things that's always important for business owners because you went into business to make money and you need to pay yourself. And there are benefits, Amen. Yeah, there are benefits for, for being on payroll, um, more so, I think, than not. So it's important. It's one of those things that you definitely need to think about. So, so Elizabeth I have, is in. Oh, go, I'm sorry. I just want to, I'm, I'm going to let you ask your question. I'm just saying Elizabeth is shouting you out because you're in One Cross Island Plaza and your offices are above hers. Above what is the website? <laughs> what is your website? It, we want to show Champagne, our audience. ChampagneDawkins.com. Okay. okay. I'm going to pull that up while Danielle is asking her question. Okay. So my other question is you um, alluded to earlier, Samantha, about when a business is in its um, early stages and the business owner may have needed to provide capitalization to the business. And so when um, a business owner gives a loan to the business for capitalization for startup, how does a business owner pay themselves back, especially if they start taking a salary right? They get to the point they're taking a salary, but they still need to pay themselves back from the loan. What does that look like? How should they proceed with that? And that's a good one. Um, sometimes um, we get that question, you know, a bit because most people have to inject capital in the business in the onset. So what I, what I recommend is as you lend money to the business is to create a promissory note. And the, the reason for that is if you are ever questioned about when you're taking the money out, then you have a paper trail because you, um, you, you, you have to recognize that the business is not you. It's separate of, of you. It's a separate legal entity, has its own federal ID number and everything. So when, when, when you are lending or even borrowing money from the business, there needs to still be a separation. So what I recommend is if you're putting money in, go ahead and um, get a promissory note between you and the business to keep it. It's important because we've had a few um, instances where the IRS did audits and people were taking the money back that they had put in the business, but they couldn't, they couldn't provide the evidence that they put the business in to begin with, put the money in, I should say, to begin with. So have a promissory note. And if you're injecting money, if you're paying by a check, keep a copy of the check that you're depositing into business's account. So you can have that record and that trail. When you're taking that money back from the money you've lent, it's not income. It's not income to you. It's not taxable. 
but it will become so if you don't have the evidence to show that you put it in in the first place. So the, the, the onus is on you to prove that you are entitled to take these monies out without tax implications and to protect yourself, do a promissory note at the beginning with the date and whatever terms you have and also keep the evidence that you put the money in. And nowadays you may not even have a check. It might be a wire transfer where you transfer money from your personal account to the business's account. Keep a copy of that bank statement and keep it with the notes and highlight it on the statement to show that this is money that I then transferred from my account into the businesses. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's, that's really uh, important for businesses to know when tracking and there's always a way to figure out the answer, but that's why you need the professionals. So building on that question, how much should a business owner think about to budget for payroll? Because I think that's also something that a lot of people consider, is it too expensive? But for you and what you offer, you're telling everyone that if you outsource it, it's cost effective. It's actually saving you time and could actually make you more money if you're organized. I agree. I agree. <laughs> to, to, to actually do the calculations yourself and to do the filings yourself, it takes away from time that you could be working in the business and doing some other things that could improve the, the, the business itself. And back office on a whole, I tell folks, if you can do your accounting and uh, your tax returns, then go ahead and get them done. But I'll, I'll, I'll make an admission to you. Even as a CPA, um, and one of the reasons why we went in private practice is because I was an entrepreneur first, and I saw some of the challenges that we were having and the resources that not really being able to tap into people to get answers. So um, what I would say is that we moved, we went into private practice so that based on our experience, we could share the information that we have. But even when I had just started out as a CPA, I had someone that was doing our books. So I was not the one doing it because I knew that for me to do that, along with everything else I needed to do in the business, I was not going to be efficient and I was not going to be effective. So you need to know at what point it makes sense for you to engage someone. And Samantha, I want to say that what you just said is so, so important. We had another accountant come on who is a CPA and a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And but he is an entrepreneur in the sense now that he is a restaurant owner. Mm -hmm. And he said, although he is a CPA and a lawyer, he had someone do his taxes as well. So it's interesting. You're the second CPA that said that you do not do your own taxes, even though you're a CPA. So there's something to be said for that. Yeah. You know? yes. um, and the other thing is, I want to ask you, you know, I'm thinking about little nuggets that you said in your other answers. And when you get to a place because we want to not only make money as you said as a business owner um we also want to build wealth right that's something that we want to do and so that balance what do you suggest there's no right or wrong but there's different ways of doing that you talked about profit sharing you talked about there's investment vehicles there could be a SEP, you know SEP ira and you know, you have a, a maximum of seven thousand dollars, and you could put that in. You know, that's a tax deduct tax deduction right there in regards to tax liability. So, how do you determine? I know it's based on potentially that individual business owner. But how, as the financial consultant, how do you determine that? Like, what vehicle they should use, not only to um, give themselves a salary, but to invest for the future as well. So that, that question is a multi-part answer. And I'll tell you, one of the one of the first things is your planning, right? So even in terms of the venture that you've chosen to invest your capital and time in, it's, it's important. You want to make sure that even before you start, whatever you're going to engage in, you've done some research to ensure that this is something that's viable and it will allow me to build wealth. I have seen instances that there are some business owners who started out a venture without initially doing the research and the groundwork, <clears throat> excuse me, and it didn't work out. It didn't work out because you have to make sure that you actually land in a place that you'll be happy, it will utilize your skills, and it's something that you want to do. So once you land on that thing, then you can make sure that you're putting in place the, um, the, the the, the things to allow you to succeed. One of the things I suggest is to first surround yourself with the professionals who can guide you along the way. 
Because even with the best of ideas, if you don't have the right team of professionals to guide you, then you may have challenges that you wouldn't have foreseen. So it, it, it includes a good idea. I mean, even the restaurant, you got to pick the right location. Then when you end up in, in the, the venture that you think is a good fit, surrounding yourself with the professionals and actually listening to them. So if you have the right team and you're in the right venture and you listen to folks who you trust to help you grow, then you have a good formula for success. And, and building wealth is something that a lot of times um, we see small business owners not thinking to that level yet. They're probably still in survival mode. And the mature companies that we work with, we talk to them about how do you even create a legacy and how do you transition out of your business when you're ready to leave? So those are the things that you can talk to a business about when it's gotten to a level where it's mature enough to have those conversations. Because a lot of small businesses include family, <clears throat> excuse me, and some of them want to transition it to the next generation. So, you know, we, we also have really successful businesses where the children are not interested, but there, there are some of them that that's the plan. They want to make sure that they leave something stable for the next generation. And these are conversations that you have over time based on where you are in the terms of the life cycle of your business then your professional will guide you accordingly. But when you start, you know, think ahead. Think ahead of the next five years, the next 10 years, the next 15 years, or even more. I start this business, how can I get out of it? Because you're not gonna be here forever. And, you know, you, you even start having those thoughts from the onset, I think it prepares you for success. Absolutely. You said something there. I mean, so many nuggets that you're dropping in between and Danielle and I trying to catch them all so that we can make sure that everyone else is picking them up. But you said have a good team, but you have to listen to the team because sometimes you are blessed with having good people around, but then you don't listen. It's like you're blocking your blessing. So it's making sure that you have the team, you're listening to the team. But that last piece that you just shared, you know, that's the bomb drop legacy. What do you do to sell the business eventually or transfer it to family and what does that look like it really forces you to look at the structure and the viability of what you're doing so thank you for sharing that with our business owners but we did have a question from elizabeth she said what percentage of your expenses should be payroll okay so um elizabeth and i are going to have a conversation after this call <laughs> <laughs> But the quick answer is it depends. It depends on what kind of business you're in and um, how much do you need to retain in the business for the future. So, you know, what I would say is if you have a business that's not one with a high cost of goods, so your service enterprise, you can have a higher percentage of payroll than someone who is in construction, for example, who has to use um, cash to buy materials and the other things to put into the next project. So it, it's a little it's a little unique and we'll talk about that and we can talk about on an individual um, basis what that percentage should look like. But you know one of the things to always consider is that the payroll is, is an expense. It's a deduction for the business and it reduces the liability for taxes at the end of the year because it's a true expense. So it should be something that's reasonable and um, it should be something that the business can afford. Mm -hmm. So I have two questions for you, Samantha. And mm -hmm. that is, that's a great question Elizabeth asked. So as a CPA, when Elizabeth speaks to you after this webinar mm -hmm. <laughs> this morning, when, when you're looking at your individual clients and they're asking you that question, do you go by industry standards because I know that, you know, there's an industry standard, like construction, there's a certain percentage that they should be spending on cost of goods sold. They should be looking at their percentages in comparison in comparison to the industry standards, whatever your industry is. As a CPA, do you use that or you think that's more book and you do it in a more practical way? So, I mean, it's good to see. It's good to see what the industry standards are, but we, 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 we customize things based on the individuals. So even though industry might say one thing, it's a guideline, but we look at individual because even, uh, even for an industry, it depends on where you are in terms of the business itself. How long have you been in business? And um, that, that's a big factor for where you would stack up versus industry. 
So we really try to customize and that's why the consultations are important. We try to be available for our clients so that we can guide them along and give them real time advice. Okay. And my other question for you is cost of goods sold. Mm -hmm. Again, you know, that's it. That could be a, a significant expense or it could be minimal expense. Right. So even for service businesses that if you have independent contractors or even, you know, direct employees, but you're a service business. So you're using them to still provide a service to your client. Mm -hmm. It's not as easy as construction or something like that. Well, how do you designate what is cost of goods sold as it relates to a service business that may not have, you know, supplies and things like that? Or if you're a restaurant owner, you know, the flour, the rice, mm -hmm. you know, all of that stuff. So what does that look like for a service business as it relates to cost of goods sold? So what I would do in that is, is to tell you this, right? If you if you look at the definition of cost of goods sold, it's um it's anything that's a direct cost, direct cost for for whatever it is that you're providing, whether it's a service or a good. So I'm looking for, I want to give you a, a word for word description here. So it is the <clears throat> the direct cost of producing and typically cost of goods is typically for companies that have goods, right? So you have direct costs um, in even in a service um, company, but it's not necessarily goods related. So you will have, you know, the direct cost of sales, for example, might be something that you may have in a, in a service industry, but the, the it's whatever is the direct cost. So if it's people and people are a direct cost for, for even a construction company, because you're using the, the the labor of your people to get the construction completed. So it's materials, but it's also services. So anything that's the direct cost for running your business and you have to have it to generate the sale really falls into the direct and the cost of sales number. Now you have then the other expenses on peripheral, your administrative costs. So it's things like your, your rent even, because you could operate probably without renting a space. So some of those are the indirect costs are the things that would be outside of your cost of sales or your cost of goods sold. But it's anything that's directly. So if you, you for example, then you have a project where you're going to be training folks. And in order for you to do it, you have to hire two contractors to help you get it done. Those are direct costs that would hit the, the cost of sales for your project. That, that's really the distinction. It's the direct cost versus the indirect so what about the the business owner who's a consultant that could be mm -hmm. myself that could be stacy that could be any of our other um guests on the show today and they are paying themselves a salary but they're also part of producing the work product so do they split that and do the salary for the general administrative stuff and the things they do as an officer and then they do you know, the dollar amount that they charge the, you know, the client for as a direct expense, because that's part of the cost of services. How does that work as a, as a, as a business owner? Good question. And what, um, what I'll say is officers are typically considered employees. So even though you're doing some things that are, you know, consulting per se it's t it's tough to decipher what when you are doing work for the the business and when you are being you know a consultant a consultant is not typically the label that an officer has again it, it talks to the, the the control element and um you 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 can play multiple roles like elizabeth is saying but from a tax standpoint you're typically considered an employee and it's not encouraged to have a w-2 and a 1099 from the same entity. So that kind of will hopefully help clear up the, the, the waters a little bit. You you normally don't have somebody getting two different statements from the same entity. It's really difficult to show when, when, when would you have the control and when don't you. So it's easier, in my opinion, to go as a W-2. Now, remembering that when you do a W-2, it, all it means is that your taxes are withheld for you in advance through your payroll. What you ultimately owe for taxes will become calculated when you file your return. B 
being a W-2 simply means that your taxes are withheld at the time the payroll is run and a portion of your social security is going to be paid for you. You may want to be, you know, be in a position where part of social security is paid for you so that you're not paying all of it at the end of the year, particularly when the business will get a deduction for paying its tax. Absolutely. So I want to get into some questions around the different kinds of offerings, because like you said, you customize and we have that up on the screen that you have a couple of options. So if you could give a, like, a high level overview of the difference between your comprehensive payroll services, the after the fact payroll services, online payroll processing and your custom payroll report service. So you give multiple options for business owners, like you said, depending on where they are and their business structure. So can you just give us some highlights from those three, four areas that you offer specifically around payroll? Okay. Do you want to scroll back up to the top so I can make sure I hit them all? Oh, okay. Here we go. Okay. So the, the payroll services, um, the, the, we have platforms where um, we can get a little bit of echo on, 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 on. The, the service that we provide is the comprehensive speech. So we, we will do the, um, the calculations. What we start off with is we get a setup profile from from our clients where we, we, we see what kind of an entity they are. The withholding information comes from each employee. So based on their personal profile, we will, um, you know, they'll come up and tell us what the withholdings are. Normally we don't do the, um, the payroll, the printing of checks, even though that's an option because most people don't want to get checks. They rather direct deposit. So we'll do direct deposit for free once we have all the withholdings established. Um, we work actually quite a bit in the background with um, our own proprietary system where we partner through, uh, through Paychex. And we're actually partners with both Paychex, ADP, and most of the larger payroll services because there are some payrolls that I would rather not do. When we get into complicated payrolls where they need to be um, certified, particularly in the construction space, there are some specific requirements for contractors. We'd rather not do those. And we work with um, the larger, the, the other payroll service companies to do that. But for most small businesses, you have the, um, the payroll done and it's done based on whatever cycle you choose. And we will then have the, the taxes remitted to all the agencies that are involved. So your withholdings are done pretty soon after your payroll is run. At the, the end of the year, and I'm having a little time reading this because it's so tiny, but it's fine. At the end of the year, we do the payroll processing. So quarterly, we file all the returns for you. The state, the city, the, the federal returns, we file them all. And... Um, we provide you with those returns because you need them for different reasons. Most, most, most folks, they do um, audits. The unemployment insurance auditors come in quarterly to make sure that the, the payroll is done. We also do um, the, we give the people the option of paying the unemployment insurance at the time of the payroll. So there's like a pay as you go functionality where if you choose to, at the time we run your payroll, we can also have your, on, your insurance paid for unemployment. That helps um, a lot of companies so they don't have to, to worry too much about the audit at the end of the year. Can I, can I jump in, Samantha, as a benefit? Again, with the PPP, I'm just using it as an example, the fact that you send the client the quarterly statements, you know, P, with PPP, it all happened in March, right? And so mm -hmm. when you talk about payroll and things that you have to submit, Something like that makes it so much easier to submit that information, you know, in a situation like that. So people don't realize that something as simple as getting sent the quarterly information makes a huge difference. Correct. I'm going to go on the um, website myself because I can see it a little bit better. Um, sprinting a little <laughs> 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 sure, sure, absolutely. And I just want to say, Danielle, that's a great point as well. You you don't want to have to get ready. You want to be ready. So when you have services like yours uh, and just taking the time 
to do your due diligence so that when opportunities come, we can strike while the iron is hot. Right, correct. All right, so I think I probably just went through the comprehensive section. Mm -hmm. um, for after the fact, you know, there's some folks who they, they, they've already run payroll. This is not a majority of folks, but there are people who've run payroll for reasons on the side and um, they wanna make sure that the returns are filed afterwards. And we will then take their payroll records, however they prepared it. Most times it's manually prepared in that kind of a scenario. We'll make sure that the information is posted to our data files. And then we're able to generate the, the returns if it's within quarters. If it's not and it's at the end of the year, then we'll, we'll be able to help folks to generate the W-2s and all the year-end filings that are needed. And then um, we help them with the creation of their reports for their, for their new hires. This particular after-the-fact payroll service is not a recommendation, but it happens sometimes when folks have cash flow issues. They will pay their employees, but not necessarily do all the necessary pay, the, the paperwork. We can come in on the back end after that is done and make sure your filings are done. There are dangers to doing this because if you come in at a time when the deadlines have already passed for filing, then there will be penalties for the returns being filed late. But you'd rather be penalized for them being filed late than not filing them at all. Because once year end comes around, your employees are going to anticipate W-2s and they anticipate them normally in January. That allows them to file their personal taxes on time. So this is not a recommendation, but it happens. It happens in instances, several instances. And what we do is we try to help you at that end to clean up things and make sure that you have your reports and your returns filed um, and in for your employees' benefit and for yours. Samantha, one more thing I want to bring up is that um, you help, like you said, you have this, this setup sheet and everything, but something that the business owners also need to understand is that they when they are bringing on new employees there is like a packet that they should be giving their new employees there's certain um compliant documents that they need to have and they may need to consult along with what you're doing with payroll they may need to consult with the hr consultant to know the proper paperwork for new hires is right. okay so and that's a good that's a good thing you mentioned because even though we do the filings there is a compliance element the mm -hmm. compliance element is not necessarily something that we do we can guide you but a lot of those are as if you had an hr function which we don't claim to be hr we do the payroll processing and there's a distinction yeah i just wanted to say that because you know sometimes we're unconsciously incompetent which means we don't know what we don't know Mm -hmm. So they may think for you as a CPA that you're okay, you're handling the paperwork, but they're not doing the other piece compliance piece from an HR perspective that that is goes alongside what you're doing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and then the, the other thing on here is the the custom payroll report service, which is on the website. So like I was mentioning before, there are um, audits that are done occasionally for workers' compensation, for example, or the unemployment insurance um, entities. They will audit you uh, periodically, typically annually. If you have workers' compensation, you know that they come in at least once a year. Um, and these are things that we will help you with. These audits go very smoothly when you have a, a payroll service provider because the source documents are going to be the... Um, the payroll taxes typically. They will go to the payroll taxes. New York looks to look at the their their particular file in the NYS 45, which lists all the employees and what they were paid by quarter. So when you have a service provider and they provide you with the reports, all of these audits and these reviews go a lot, lot smoother. Absolutely. Well, thank you for explaining. I thought it was important for folks to know what the options are when you get the opportunity for a consultation, particularly um, with your company. But like you said, there are many ways in which this can be done. The goal is to get it done. And Mecca had a question about the human resources packaging, uh, what that looks like. That's a separate HR consultant. Um, you know, we're talking about the payroll aspect, but we did have two HR consultants that were on the show uh, a couple of episodes back. And that's the kind of service that you can get to make sure the package that Danielle alluded to, you just have the right documents that are in place so that when you need to reference them, 
it's there and you can track and have the payroll records that um, Champagne Dawkins provides complement that information. So I can't believe, I mean, this has been just so great. Like, I feel we need to give you an award, Samantha. Like, you are <laughs> the guru <laughs> of payroll. We're so excited that you came on our show because that is what we prided ourselves with doing from the ground up, real-time issues and real-time solutions and payroll. I mean, that was the buzzword for 2020 when it comes to the PPP and small businesses. And ultimately we're praying for everybody to be able to successfully thrive post what we've witnessed in 2020. So thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and your light with us. I'll let Danielle ask her last questions, but Samantha, honey, I'm gonna be giving you a call. I love the commercial and that, that's how it should be. You know, especially as we work with each other, Queen Strategy Partners, we are the example of collaboration and joint venture. That's what we do. And I'm all about collaborating with other businesses that provide value. And clearly you are providing value, Samantha. So thank you so much for your brilliance. And, you know, let's hear it for the black women. We know it's the year of the black woman, honey. We're going to change this election. Everybody go vote. That's our public service announcement. Go vote. That's right. Vote early and be a part of the process as we watch her story. I don't say history anymore. Her story unfold uh, collectively together, moving the needle forward for the interest of not only individuals and families, but businesses, because we know that small businesses are the foundation of the economy and we wanna see each and every person be successful. So my beautiful co-hosts will close this out and we thank you again, Mecca, Elizabeth, everyone who's been tuning in, watching. Remember, follow us at Queen Strategy Partners. Go to our YouTube if you wanna catch the replays of the show and we'll be back, not next week, but the week after, every other week as we close out 2020. So I just wanna say that you know to our guests, Thank you so much for spending another hour with Stacy and myself and our co-host, Ms. Samantha Champagne. We <laughs> so appreciate your knowledge and your expertise. I know I personally appreciate it because it can make a world of difference. You know, when you talk about having a good team, your CPA is like front and center in regards to having a great team. And I so so appreciate you, you know, again, for the, the impact that you've had on my business. And that's why I always, I'm like, Samantha, when can you talk here? When can you do this? You know, do you want to be part of the goodie package, the goodie bag for the Black Business Owners Forum? Because I know the good work that you're doing and I want to spread the gospel of the good work that you're doing. <laughs> so I just want to say again, thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Um, and I just want to say to our uh, folks that are here with us, you know, week in and week out and now bi-weekly in and bi-weekly out, we appreciate you. We hope that you take this knowledge. I always say knowledge is, is not really, it doesn't become wisdom until you use it and you apply it. Um, and our goal is constantly to bring you great resources via Ms. Sam Samantha Champagne so that you can get the knowledge you need to not only survive, but thrive. Because you do have an opportunity to thrive, even in the midst of COVID-19, in the midst of 2020. And we stay from the ground up because, you know, we have been like trying to get you on solid ground so that you can get to higher ground. So until we see you again in two weeks, make it happen, be productive, and we're looking forward to seeing you, as they say, same bat time, same bat channel. <laughs> so have a great two weeks, everyone. <laughs>